live from the Computer History Museum in Mountain View, California. It's the Cube covering DevNet Create 2018. Brought to you by Cisco. Hey, welcome back, everyone. This is the Cube live here in Mountain View, California, the heart of Silicon Valley for Cisco's DevNet Create. This is their cloud developer uh, event. It's not the main Cisco DevNet, which is more of the, the Cisco developers. This is much more cloud native DevOps. I'm joined with my co-host uh, Lauren Cooney, and our next guest is Christine Yen, who's co-founder and chief product officer of Honeycomb.io. Welcome to the Cube. Thank you. Great to have an uh, entrepreneur and also a chief product officer because you kind of blend in you know, the entrepreneurial zeal, but also you've got to build a product in the cloud native world. You have uh, you guys done a few ventures before. First, take a minute and talk about what you guys do, what the company's built on, what's the mission, what's your vision? Absolutely. Uh, Honeycomb is built, we are an observability platform um, to help people find the unknown unknowns. Our whole thesis is that the world is getting more complicated. Uh, we have microservices and containers, and instead of having five application servers that we you know, treated like pets in the past, we now have uh, 500 containers running that are more like cattle, and where any one of them might die um, at any given time. And we need our tools to be able to support us to figure out how and why, and, and when, something, when something happens, what happened and why, and how, how do we resolve it? Um, our, you know, we, we look around at the landscape and we feel like uh, this, this dichotomy out there of um, we have logging tools and we have metrics tools. And those really evolved from the fact that in 1995, right, we kind of yeah. had to choose between grep or counters. And as, as technology evolved, those evolved to distributed grep or uh, RRDs. Yeah. And then, mm -hmm. then we have distributed grep with fancy UIs and, well, fancy RRDs with UIs. Um, and Honeycomb, we, we were started a couple years ago, yeah. we really feel like, what if you didn't have to choose? What if technology supported the power of having all the context there the way that you do with logs while still being able to provide instant analytics yeah. the way that you have with metrics? So the problem that you're solving is one, antiquated methodologies from old architectures and stacks, if you will, to helping people save time with the arcane tools. Absolutely. Is that kind of the main premise? We want people to be able to debug their production systems. All right, so what's, the, what's beyond that now, the developer that you're targeting, Take us through a, a day in the life of where you are helping them vis-a-vis -vis the old way. Absolutely. So I can tell, um, I'll tell a story of uh, when myself and my co-founder Charity were working together at Parse. Um, Parse, for those who aren't familiar, is, uh, used to be, RIP, a backend for mo mobile apps. You can think of someone who just wants to build an iOS app, doesn't want to deal with data storage, user records, things like that. Um, and Parse, um, Started in 2011, got bought by Facebook in 2013, spun down the very beginning of 2016. And in 2013, when, we, when the acquisition happened, we were supporting somewhere on the order of 60,000 different mobile apps. Um, each one of them could be uh, you know, totally different workload, totally different usage pattern, um, but any one of them might be experiencing problems. Um, and Again, in this old world, this pre-Honeycomb world, we had our top-level metrics. We had latency, response, uh, uh, overall throughput, error rates, and we were very proud of them. We were very proud of these like big dashboards on the wall that, that were green, um, and they were great. Except when you had someone, had a customer write in, be like, being like, "Hey, parse is down," and we look at our dashboard, we'd be like, "Nope, it's not down. It must be, it must be you. It must be network issues." That's on your end. <laughs> yeah, that's on your end. <laughs> Um, not a good answer. <laughs> not a good answer, and especially not if that if that customer was Disney, right? When our top level, when you're when you're dealing with these high level metrics, uh, you and you're processing like you know tens tens or hundreds of thousands of requests per second. When Disney comes in, they've got eight requests a second, and they're seeing all of them fail, even though those are really important eight requests per second. You can't you can't tease that out of your graphs. You can't figure out why they're failing, what's going on, how to fix it. You've got to dispatch an engineer to go add a bunch of, you know, if app ID equals Disney, yeah. track it down, figure out what's going on there, and it takes that takes time. Yeah. Um, and when we got to Facebook, we were exposed to a, a type of tool that essentially inspired Honeycomb as it is today, that let us capture all this data, capture a bunch of information about every, everything that was happening down to these eight requests per second, and when we, we, you know, a customer complained, we could immediately isolate, yeah. oh, it's one app, okay, let's zoom in. For this one customer, this tiny customer, let's look at their uh, throughput, 
error rates latency. Oh, okay, something looks funny there. Let's break down by endpoint for this customer. And it's this, this iterative, fast, highly granular yeah. investigation that, that is kind of where, where all of us are approaching today. You know, with our systems getting more complicated, you need to be able to isolate, okay, I don't care about the 200s. I only care about the 500s. Um, and within the 500s, then what's going on? What's going on with this server, with that set of containers? So this is basically uh, an issue of data, unstructured data, or have the ability to take this data <laughs> in at the same time with your eye on the prize of instrumentation. Absolutely. And then having the ability to make that addressable and discoverable in real time. Is that kind of? Yeah, um, we've, been, we've been using the term observability yeah. to describe this, this feeling of, I need to be able to find the unknown unknowns. Yeah. Um, and instrumentation is absolutely the tactic to observability of the strategy. Yeah. It is how people will be able to get information out of their systems um, in a way that is relevant to their business. Yeah. Um, a, a common thing that we'll hear is people will ask, you know, oh, can you, can you ingest my Nginx logs? Can you ingest my MySQL logs? Um, often, that's, that's a great place to start, but really, where are the problems uh, in an application? Where are your problems in the system? Usually, it's, it's the places uh, that, that are custom that the engineers wrote, um, and tools need to be able to support yeah. providing information, providing graphs, providing analytics in a way that makes it easy for the folks who wrote the code yeah to track down the problem mm -hmm. and, and address them. It's a haystack of needles. Yep, you know, absolutely. You, you all, they're all relevant, but you don't know <laughs> which needle you're going to need. Exactly. So let me just get this, so I'm backing out, just trying to understand, because this is super important, because this is really the, the key to large scale cloud ops, yep. what we're talking about here, from a developer standpoint. And we just had a great guest on, um, uh, talking about you know, testing features in production, mm -hmm. which is, you, is really the important, people want to do that. Absolutely. And then, but for one person, but in production scale, huge problem, opportunity as well. So if most people think of like, oh, I'll just ingest with Splunk. Mm -hmm. But that's a different, is that different? I mean, because people think of Splunk mm -hmm. and they think of Redshift and Kinesis on Amazon, they go, okay, is that the solution? How do you, are you guys different, are you a tool? How, how do I understand you guys' context to those known yeah. solutions? First of all, I'll kind of uh, explain the difference between ourselves and red, the red shifts and the big queries of the world, and then I'll talk about Splunk. Um, we really view those tools as primarily things built for data scientists. They, they definitely dabble in the big, they're, they're in the big data realm, um, but they are very concerned with being 100% correct. They're concerned with uh, fitting into big data tools, and they often have kind of an unfortunate delay in getting data in and making it queryable. Uh, Honeycomb is 100% built for engineers. Engineers, off people, the folks who are, who are going to be on the hook for, hey, there's downtime, what's going on? Um, and in, So one's business benefits, more data warehouse-like. Yeah, and, and what that means is that for Honeycomb, everything is real time. It's real time, um, we believe in recent data, you know, we're, we're, if you're looking for, to query data from a year ago, we're not, we're not really, we're not really uh, the thing, but instead yeah. of waiting 20 minutes for a query over a huge volume of data, you wait 10 seconds. Mm -hmm. Or, yeah. or you know, when you're when you're it's 3 a.m. and you need to figure out what's happening right now, yeah. you can go from query to query to query to query um, as you come up with hypotheses, validate them or invalidate them, and kind of continue on on your mm -hmm. inves investigation yeah. path. Um, so that's you know a, 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 that makes sense. Yeah. So yeah. data wrangling doing queries, business intelligence, insights as a service, yeah. that's all that. Yeah, we almost, uh, yeah. We, we, we played with and tossed the, uh, the tagline BI for systems because we want that, that sort of BI mentality of what's going on, let me investigate. Yeah. Um, but for the folks who need, it, need answers now and where, mm -hmm. where you know, a, an approximate answer is better, an approximate answer now is miles better than a perfect one. And you can't delay. keep large customers waiting. Right, yeah, at the end of the day, yep. you can't keep the large customers waiting. Well, it's also yep. so complicated, the edge. You know, the edge is very robust and diverse now. I mean, Node.js, has a lot of I.O. going on, for instance, so let's just mm -hmm. take an example. I heard a developer talking the other day with me, it was a jam about Node.js, it's like, oh, someone's complaining, but they have the wrong, they have, they're using Firefox. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, different memory configuration. So the developer had to debug, because oh, yeah. the complaints were coming in. Everyone else is fine, but the one guy's complaining because he's on Firefox. Well, how many tabs does he have open? What's the memory look like? So like, there's weird things. I'm going to use that as a weird example, but, yeah. but that's just the kinds of diverse things that developers have to get on, and then what, where do they start? Absolutely. I mean, so 
uh, this is something we, we ran into or we saw our developers run into all the time at Parse, right? Uh, these are mobile developers. They have to worry about not only um, which, which version of the app it is, they have to worry about which version of the app, using which version of our SDK on which version of the operating system, where any kind of strange combination of these could result in some terrible user experience. Um, and these are things that don't really work well if you're talking, if you're, if you're trying, if you're relying on some sort of pre-aggregated time series system like, um, like the evolution of the RRDs I mentioned. Um, and for folks who are trying to address this, something like Splunk, um, these logging tools, frankly, a lot of these tools are built on storage engines that are intended for full text search. They're unstructured text, you're grepping over them and then trying to you're build indices yeah. and structure on top of that. There's some lag involved too in that. Mm -hmm. There's so much lag involved and, and it, there's almost kind of this negative feedback loop built in where if you want to add more data, if you want to, if on each log line you want to start tracking browser user yeah. agent, you're going to incur not only extra storage cost, you're going to incur extra read time costs because yeah. you're reading back more data, even if you don't even yeah. care about that on most queries, and you're probably incurring cost on the right time to maintain these indices. Yeah. Uh, Honeycomb, we're a column store through and through. We, we do not care about your unstructured text logs. We, really don't want them, we want you to structure your data. Do you guys write your own column store, or is it? We did write our own column store, uh, because ultimately there's nothing that off the shelf that gave us the speed yeah. that we wanted. We wanted to be able to, hey, sending us data blobs with 20, 50, 200 keys, but if you're running analysis and all you, do, all you care about is a simple filter and account, yeah. you shouldn't have to pull in all like a Ferrari, if you customize it, it's really purpose built, same Absolutely. as you guys did. That is. So talk about the, um, the dynamic, because now you're dealing with things like, I mean, I just had a conversation with someone who's looking at, say, blockchain, mm -hmm. where there's some costs involved, obviously, writing to the blockchain. Mm -hmm. And this is not like a crypto thing, it's more of a supply chain thing. They want visibility into latency and things of that nature. This sounds like you would fit there as a potential use case. Is that something that you guys thought of at all? Uh, it could absolutely be. You know, I'm actually not super familiar with the blockchain um, or blockchain-based applications, but ultimately Honeycomb is intended for you to be able to answer questions about your system um, in a way that tends to stymie existing tools. Uh, so we see lots of people come to us from kind of strange use cases who just want to be able to instrument hey, I have this custom logic, I want to be able to look at what it's doing, and so when something either, you know, when, when a customer complains, my graphs yeah. are fine, or when my, my graphs are complaining, being able to go in and figure out why, you know. Take a minute to talk about the company um, you founded, how many employees, funding, if you can talk about it, and um, use case customers you have now, and, and we're, how do you guys engage? Is it service? Is it, do I download code? Uh -huh. Is it SaaS? I mean, you yeah. got this, all this great tech. Yep. What's the value uh, proposition? I, mean, I'll, I think I'll Go down answer those. Uh, company first. All right. Status of the company. <laughs> sure. Um, Honeycomb is about 25 people, 30 people. Um, we raised a Series A in January. Um, we are about two and a half years old, and uh, we are very much SaaS is the future. We're, we're very opinionated about a number of things. Um, and how we want customers to interact with us. So we're SaaS only. Um, we do offer kind of a secure proxy option for folks who ha have PII concerns. Um, we only take structured data. So our, at our API, you can use whatever, whatever you want to, to slurp data from your system, but at our API, we want uh, JSON. Mm -hmm. yeah. We do offer kind of a, a wide variety of integrations, connect connectors, SDKs, to help you structure that data. But you ultimately, provide SDKs to the, your customers? We do, okay. um, so that if they want to instrument their application, you know, we, we just have the niceties around like batching and, and doing things asynchronously so it doesn't block their application. Um, but ultimately, uh, so we, we try to meet folks where they're at, but it's, it's 2016. You, it's so you have a hardened API. 18. API pretty much <laughs> defines your service yep. from, in, from an inbound standpoint. Yes. Um, Prices, costs, how does someone engage with you guys? When does someone know to engage? <laughs> Where's the smoke signals? When is the house on fire? Is it like mm. uh, people are standing around? What's the problem? When does someone know to call you guys up? Honeycomb? People know to call us when they're having production problems that they can't solve. When it takes them way too long to figure, to go from there's an alert that went off or a customer complaint to, oh, I found the problem, I can address it. Mm -hmm. um, we price based on storage. So we're a bunch of engineers, we try to keep the, the business side as simple as possible, um, for better or for worse. Yeah. And so the That's more good. data you send us, the more it'll cost. Okay. Um, if you want a lot of data, but short, for, stored for a short period of time, that will cost less than a lot of data stored for a long period of time. Um, 
one of the things that we, another one of the kind of uh, approaches that is possibly more common in the big data world um, and less in the monitoring world is we talk a lot about sampling. Sampling as a way to control those costs. Say you are uh, Facebook. Again, I'll return to that example. Um, Facebook knew that in this world where lots and lots of things can go wrong at any point in time, you need to be able to store the actual context of a given event happening. Some unit of work, you want to keep track of all of the pieces of metadata that make that piece of work unique. But at Facebook scale, you cannot store every single one of them. So, all right, um, you start to develop these heuristics. What things are more interesting than others? Um, errors are probably more interesting than 200 OKs. Okay, so we'll store, um, we'll keep track of most errors, we'll store 1% of successful requests. Yeah. Um, okay, well, within that, what about errors? Okay, well, things that time out are maybe more interesting than things that have permission, permissioning errors. And you start to develop this, this sampling scheme uh, that essentially maps to the interestingness of the traffic that's flowing through your system. Yeah. Uh, to throw out some numbers, I, I think- Machine learning's perfect for that, too. They can then use the sampling. <laughs> yeah, there's definitely some learning that can happen to, to determine what, what things should be dropped on the ground, what things, what requests are perfectly representative of a large swath of things. Um, and Facebook, you know, Instagram used, used a tool like this inside Facebook. Uh, they stored something like a tenth of a percent or a hundredth of a percent of their requests. Because they simply, uh, that was enough to give them a sketch of what is representative traffic, what's going wrong, or what's weird that, and is worth digging into. Final question, what's, what's your priorities for the product roadmap? What are you guys focused on now? Get some fresh funding, that's great. Uh, so expand the team, hiring, probably. What's yeah. product, what's the focus on the product? Focus on the product is uh, making this, this uh, mindset of observability accessible to software engineers. Yeah. Right, we're entering this world where more and more it's the software engineers deploying their code, uh, pu pushing things out in containers, and they're going to need to also develop this sense of, okay, well how do I make sure something's working in production? How do I make sure something uh, keeps working? And um, how do I think about correctness in this world where it's not just my component, it's my component talking to these other folks' uh, pieces. Um, we believe really strongly that uh, this, the era of the single person in a room keeping everything up is, is outdated. Um, yeah. it's, it's teams now, it's on-call rotations, it's handing off the baton and sharing knowledge. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that we're really trying to build into the product that we're hoping that this is the year that we can really deliver on this is this feeling of, you know, I, I might not be the best debugger on the team or I might not be the best person, uh, best constructor of graphs on the team, um, and John, you m might be, but how can a tool, so how can a tool help me as a new person on a team learn from what you've done? Yeah. How can a tool kind of help me be like, oh man, um, last week when John was on call, he ran into something around MySQL also. History doesn't repeat, but it rhymes. Yeah. So how can I learn from the, the sequence of, of like things that he system. ran? Mm -hmm. Yeah, like yeah. How, how can we, how can <laughs> yeah. we help yeah. build experts? Mm -hmm. yeah. How can we raise entire teams to the level of the bus debugger? And that's the beautiful, if that's the beautiful thing of metadata. Metadata is a wonderful thing. Yep. As Jeff Jonas said on the Cube, he's a Cube alumni, entrepreneur, famous uh, data entrepreneur, observation space is super critical for understanding how to make AI work. Mm -hmm. And that's to your point, having observation data, super important. And of course our observation space is all things here at DevNet Create. Christine, thanks for coming on the Cube, spending the time. Thank you. Fascinating Thank you story, great. Um, New venture, congratulations. Thank you. And uh, tackling the world of making developers more productive mm -hmm. in real time, in production, really making an impact for coders and, and sharing and learning. Here in theCUBE, we're doing our share, live coverage here in Mountain View. DevNet Create, we'll be back with more after this short break. <laughs>